Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, earlier this week, Rick and Alice talked about um, the mega chains of the mineral industry uh, as a response to some recent big changes as faced by this industry and this new world. So I'm just thinking that while understanding the current system is definitely important, trying to improve the current operation might also play a role in shaping the new future. So what I would like to talk you talk with you today is a new technique that is a, a new mechanical method that can be used to improve the flotation performance. So this is actually uh, my PhD work carried out a couple of years ago, um, supervised by Dr. Li Guen Wang and funded by ACOP. This presentation will take roughly 45 minutes and I will take you through these five sections and at the first beginning I will give you a bit introduction of this topic. The current study specifically concerns coal, which is one of the most important and most widely used fuel as energy uh, in the energy, electricity, steel making industries, etc. Um, when we have a look at the world coal consumption, from 1980 to 2016, we found that the figure more than doubled in the past 40 years. And many countries have already started the energy transition. Um, so we see a slight decrease from the year 2013, but there is no doubt that the next coming decades will still largely depend on coal. Coal as a fuel resource is the cause of many problems like the acid rain, greenhouse effect, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, et cetera. So this necessitates the need for further improving the coal cleaning techniques. How is coal cleaned in a CHPP? I, here I show a simplified flow sheet of coal cleaning circuits. So generally the raw coal from mine is classified into different size fractions, which then go through two major steps. Uh, firstly, to concentrate the product by separating out the ash contents. And secondly, to the water the products by getting rid of the water that is obtained during the separation process. How well, how efficient is the separation process? For the first three groups, the coarse, medium, and coarse slime, gravity separation is usually adopted, which is based on the density difference between the, um, the combustibles and also the mineral um, and the mineral constituents. So generally speaking, it is working well and gravity separation is adopted worldwide. Um, and for the fine slimes on the 500 microns, the most common beneficiation method is through froth flotation. It is working well, but there is still room for improvement considering a further deduction, reduction of the chemical consumption, a further improvement of the flotation performance, the handling of the difficult to float coals, and the further improvement of the saline water flotation process. Etc. So, in this study, we specifically concern froth flotation um, process. And the new technique we are introducing, we will be introducing here, is through the use of oscillatory air. It all started with this picture. So, this is published by Professor Zimmerman back in 2011. And this figure shows a comparison of the bubble generation on the two different airflow patterns. On the right hand side, it shows the air, air generation on the steady air supply pattern. And generally we see that the bubbles generated are relatively large. And when you have a look at the left hand side figure, it is the ones generated on the exactly the same system, the exactly the same um, system on, but on the different airflow patterns, that is the oscillatory airflow. So generally we see that the bubbles generated are much smaller. So in flotation, smaller bubbles means everything. So if we are able to further reduce the bubble size, the flotation kinetics might be improved. So with this in mind, we started our research of co-flotation with also the three air supply. So for a better understanding, a more comprehensive understanding of this topic, I will take you through some technical background. Flotation was patented back in 1906. Uh, it is a process that selectively separates the materials based on their difference in the physicochemical surface properties. And the raw 
fine material is usually mixed up with water and then fed into a flotation machine that is aerated with air bubbles. Air bubbles are the vehicles to transport the hydrophobic cold particles to the froth, and then the froth is removed and become the final concentrate, while the hydrophilic gamma minerals do not attach the air bubbles and stay in the pulp and then is discharged at the tailings. So sometimes chemicals are added uh, to help with the process. So air bubbles are very essential for this flotation process to happen. And how the different gas dispersion would affect the flotation performance. Here I put a picture showing a big bubble and a bunch of small bubbles which have the same volume. Um, by decreasing the bubble size, more surface area is created. So the bubble surface area flux is increased by decreasing the bubble size. And this in turn increases the bubble carrying capacity. And apart from that, the particle bubble collision efficiency is increased uh, with, increasing, with decreasing the bubble size. All of these contributes to a potential increase in the flotation kinetics with decreasing the bubble size. So what we would like to have in the flotation system is smaller bubbles. Uh, then what are the current bubble generation techniques? Are these techniques able to produce such small bubbles? Most common two techniques is through bubble breakage, through the mechanical agitation, and also air penetration through a sparger or a diffuser. These two methods are the most commonly used, the most widely used, and also easy to operate. But the problem is that the bubbles generated are relatively large, usually more than one mil. And for the new techniques like the Jameson cell and microcell, they use plunging jet and inline mixer uh, techniques. For Jameson cell, the feed is pumped into a down canvas through a lens orifice where the slurry is accelerated. Uh, and local acceleration leads to a, the generation of a low or even negative pressure, which draws air into the system and generates small bubbles. And for the microcell, uh, a portion of the tailings is recirculated back to the system through a an inline mixer where the air slurry mixture passes through these the stationary blades and air is sheared into small, bu small bubbles. For these two techniques, the bubbles generated are much smaller, less than 500 microns. Um, and the last three micro bubble generation techniques is based on the, the use of venturi tube, the dissolved air method, and the electrolysis method. Um, the bubbles generated are very small, less than 50 microns. But the problem is that there is lots of wear and also very energy intensive. When we, when we think about um, less energy cons consumption, less wear, and also at the same time, the generation of smaller bubbles, it seems that it's a bit difficult to achieve all three goals. Will the oscillatory air supply, supplying to the sparring system, make a difference? I will go through the mechanism in terms of how, by using oscillatory air, the air bubble size is, is able to be decreased. This figure shows uh, the schematic of bubble generation through percolation of an aperture. You might expect that as long as we keep the aperture size to be as small as possible, we are able to get bubbles as small as possible. But there are a couple of reasons why there is not the truth. So the first one is that the liquid attached to the perimeter of the aperture acts as the anchor, the binding, the bind, binds the, the bubbles to the exit pore. If the solid phase of the aperture is hydrophobic, this means that the gas phase inside the growing bubble acts as a second anchor that binds the bubble to the exit pore. As the volume of the bubbles grow, as the air penetrates in, the buoyant force increases until a point that the buoyant force exceeds the anchoring force. At that time, the bubble generates, generated breaks off. At this time, the bubbles generated is usually at least one order of magnitude larger than the aperture size. So there are other reasons why usually bigger bubbles are generated. One is uh, the irregular spacing of the bubbles, which causes the coalescence, and also about the channeling effect. When you have a look at um, this figure, at the first beginning of the air penetration, the radius of the curvature is very large, and it quickly decreases until the point that the hemispherical cap is formed. And after that, the radius of the curvature starts to increase again. 
when we think about the young Laplace equation, the differential pressure across a bubble surface is inversely proportional to the radius of the curvature. And so the pressure difference at the first beginning of air penetration is close to zero, and then it increases to a maximum at the hemispherical point, and after that, it decreases. This means that imagine there are parallel apertures. Once one bubble surpasses this point, the air would preferentially go into this aperture because of least resistance. As a result, this specific bubble will preferentially grow. It grows faster than the other bubbles. So this is another reason, the channeling effect. And as compared with this, with using oscillatory air supply, the alternating air and water goes back and forward. When the air comes, the bubbles start to generate. And when the air stops and the water comes, the entrapped air is, re is dislodged as air bubbles. And a pulse is generated during this process. And this pulse helps the bubbles to overcome the anchoring force that binding them to the exit pore and also uh, release them at an early stage so that smaller bubbles are able to be generated. So then people might just ask, without know the mechanism in terms of how to reduce the bubble size with using oscillatory air supply. Then the problem is that how are we able to generate oscillatory air supply? In the current study, two different um, devices is, uh, are used for generating the oscillatory air supply. The first one is called a fluidic oscillator. It consists of a fluidic amplifier and a feedback loop. Air is first supplied through the supply terminal S. And then because of the quanta effect of jet attachment to the nearby wall, it would preferentially follow the wall and, be, and goes through one of the two outputs, Y1 or Y2. And here we say Y1. As we can see from here, the, cross, the cross-sectional area of the supply terminal S decreases in the streamwise direction leading to local acceleration because of the mass conservation here. So this becomes a sensitive spot. Local acceleration here leads to the generation of a low or even negative pressure near the control terminal X1, which draws air through the feedback loop from the other control terminal X2. And then because of the amplification effect that any action applied in a sensitive spot at a low power as compared with a strong, uh, fuel, strong flow field power is sufficient enough to make a substantial change. So as the, control in the, con as the flow in the control terminal X1 gains enough momentum, even though it's still much lower as compared with the strong flow field power, it is sufficient enough to make a change and divert the flow direction from the output Y1 to Y2. And as this device is symmetric, it will then, the jet deflection will then happen in the opposite way after a delay that the flow in the control terminal X2 gains enough momentum to deflect the airflow from Y2 to Y1 again. So in this way, uh, the oscillatory air supply is generated in the output Y1 and Y2 alternatingly. Usually uh, a frequency as high as a few hundred hertz can be obtained with using this device. And the second device we used is a solenoid valve. And this is just a simple commercial product, a commercial high frequency product. The air goes into one of the two outputs here, and it has a control unit. So we are able to set up the frequency um, through a, a laptop end. So what have I done? Um, as I mentioned previously, the oscillatory air specifically concerns the Spartan system. So, but at that time, we don't have a flotation column in the lab. So the first thing for me to do is that I built up a flotation column. So it's five centimeter in diameter and more than one meter in height. And the feed is just, uh, fed into the flotation system at 45 centimeter below the overflowing lip. 
um, and it's made of plexiglass. And for easy moving around, it was um, installed onto a stand. Uh, and for the spotting system, a metal spring was used with the aperture size of 100 microns. Um, it allows the air to be pushed into the flotation system and also allows the tidings to be discharged out of the system. Apart from that, I've also got a feed sump, a peristaltic pump, and a level control bucket. The slurry is preconditioning this feed, feed sump and then be pumped into the flotation column through this peristaltic pump. And for the level control, it's based on the communicating principle. It's connected to the tailing discharge point. Uh, and the pulp level, control, pulp level control is achieved through adjusting the vertical position of this small level control bucket. And both the concentrate and the tightening is redire redirected back to the feed sump to achieve semi-continuous uh, operation. Uh, this study focuses on the air supply. So as a reference, we supplied the conventional steady air supply where the air flow rate stayed the same as a function of the time. And in comparison, we supply the second airflow pattern, which is the oscillatory air supply generated by a solenoid valve. And the third pattern is an oscillatory air supply generated by a fluidic oscillator. And throughout the experiments, the airflow pattern is the only one controlled variable. So for the samples I used, uh, I call it sample B with the P80-2B300 microns, ash content 17%. And the preliminary test results show that no collector is needed. So this sample is required as very super hydrophobic. So a proportion of sample B was put into the oven at 120 degrees for 10 hours to oxidize the sample. And get oxidized the sample B1. And also a proportion of sample B was sieved that you get the ultrafine minus 38 micromaterials. Uh, and a proportion of sample B2 was sent into the oven at 120 degrees for 10 hours to get the oxidized ultrafine material. The ash contents for the ultrafine is uh, 30%. In sample C, it's basically simply because of a lack of samples. So we use another sample. Uh, I use the actual processed water to do the flotation tests, except the saline water flotation tests. And for chemicals, I just use the uh, the most conventional one, diesel as collector and frother as MIBC. And prior to the test, I uh, looked for the, the optimum condition of the chemicals for sample B and sample C. And as for the procedure of the experiments, firstly, the slurry was preconditioned here in the feed sump and equipped with a slurry here and then was pumped into the system through this peristaltic pump at a predetermined rate. And then the airflow pattern was controlled to be either steady or oscillatory airflow generated by either be a fluidic oscillator or a solenoid valve. And chemical was added in preconditioned. And after waiting for a minimum of three particle residence time, uh, we assumed that you reached the steady state and, and then we started to sample link, started to sample the products and tidings first, followed by feed. And as for the results, we would have a look at the, uh, the yield, which is the mass flow rate of the concentrate as a proportion to the mass flow rate of the feed, ash content, which is the non-combustible uh, ash contents after the coal is burnt and uh, the combustible recovery, which is the combustible recovery, recovering the uh, concentrate as a percentage of the total combustible recovery present in, in the feed. And lastly, it's the efficiency index, which is uh, uh, an integrated parameter, which takes into account of the combustible recovery and ash content. So let's have a look at the results. First one is about the effect of the frequency of the oscillatory air. So here it shows, the figure shows a combustible recovery as a function of the frequency of the oscillatory air, where zero represents steady air supply. And we can see from here that the combustible recovery stands at roughly 44%. 
and the ash content is about 3.3 percent and at the low frequency of oscillatory airflow conditions we see that the flotation performance actually worsened uh, with the combustible recovery decreasing to less than 30 percent um, while we further increase the frequency of oscillatory air to above to 20 hertz and above we saw a substantial increase in the flotation performance and above 36 hertz is kind of the curve is kind of level off so we consider that 36 hertz as the optimum, taking into account the lifespan of the solenoid valve. So at the same time, for the ash content, it's increased a little bit, but still below, roughly at 4%. So it increased about 1%. So generally speaking, the frequency of the oscillatory air affects the flotation performance, while at low frequency, it's negatively affecting the flotation performance and while at the high frequency levels, it's positively affecting the flotation performance. And this figure shows the potential use of oscillatory air in reducing the flutter consumption. This figure on your left-hand side shows the product yield as a function of the product ash content for three Fraud dosage levels as 7.5, 15, and 25 ppm for two airflow patterns, steady and also the three. When we have a look at 15 ppm represented by the tri uh, triangle, triangles, when we change the airflow pattern from steady to oscillatory, we see a 19 percentage points increase in the product yield. While for the ash content, the increase was about one percentage point. And also when we compare steady air at a high frother dosage level with oscillatory air at a low frother dosage level, it's kind of similar. And this could also be represented by uh, this efficiency index uh, figure. So here oscillatory air flow at a lower MIBC dosage level gives a similar or even slightly higher EI index than steady air at a higher frother dosage level. So frother, the chemical, dose, chemical consumption substitutes one of the big parts in the coal CHTP. So if we are able to uh, potentially bring down the chemical dosage, and that's one contribution as well to the CHTP. And oscillatory air flow could potentially do that. This figure shows the potential use of oscillatory air flow with helping the flotation of difficult to flow codes. Uh, here in the figure showing on your left hand side, it shows a concentrate yield as a function of the concentrate ash content for four different size, for four different co particles, for co samples with different surface properties. For the hydrophobic co fines, we see roughly 20 percentage points increasing the product yield. And for the oxidized fines, the increase was about more than 30 percentage points, and that's a lot. And while for the ash content, it increased roughly less than two percentage points. And the same was observed for the hydrophobic ultrafines and also the oxidized ultrafines below 38 microns. So this is again, can be seen from the efficiency index curves here. In every case with every co-sample with different surface properties, we see a significant increase in the EI value. So with the difficult to flow curves, usually it's a problem with the plants. So what the plants usually do is that they will look for different methods to try to solve the problem. Um, so some of them try to use chemicals, different chemicals to improve the flotation performance, but the use of chemicals might just bring um, some more problems in the downstream operation, et cetera, et cetera. But with using the oscillatory air flow, it is able to improve the flotation of these difficult to flow codes by simply using a mechanical method. And one, another surprising result we found is that the use of oscillatory air supply could potentially increase the throughput. Uh, in the current study, I, 
I changed the throughput by two different means. The first one is to increase the solids percent in the feed. And the second one is to increase the volumetric flow rate of the feed. So in both the two cases, the throughput is um, greatly improved. And here I only show the second case. This figure shows the concentrate yield as a, cons as a function of the concentrate ash content for four different feed flow rate conditions. The majority of the, all of the experiments we carried out and the results shown here is done at the feed flow rate of 0 0.9 liter per minute. And by doing this test, we tried to push up the feed flow rates all the way from 0 0.9 to doubled and then tripled and then quadrupled. So let's have a look at the results of the basic condition, 0 0.9 liter per minute. When we increase, when we change the airflow pattern from steady to oscillatory, the concentrate yield was increased about 20 percentage points, while the ash content was still below 5%. With increase in the feed flow rate, we see a steady decrease in the concentrate yield for both the two airflow conditions, which is actually expected given two reasons. The first one is because of a reduction in the particle residence time inside the flotation column. And the second one is that higher feed flow rate actually brings more turbulence into the flotation column. In flotation columns, near plug flow condition is more favorable for froth flotation. When we compare oscillatory air as, uh, with the triple the feed flow rate as represented by the purple triangles here. We steady air at the lowest feed flow rate, 0 0.9 liter per minute. We find that the product yield is kind of similar and the ash content was about one percentage point higher. So this could mean that with the, the use of all sort of three air, the throughput the feed flow rate and, and hence the throughput might be tripled. And that's a lot of improvement. And just before I, sh I show you all different improvements for different co-samples with different surface properties um, and the potential improvement for the throughput, et cetera, et cetera. And what are the background reasons for all these improvements? The first one must be the gas dispersion difference. So here I showed you a very direct look at the gas dispersion difference in the two systems. Uh, one is fed up with the steady air supply on your left hand side and the other one is the oscillatory air supply on your right hand side. So there might be a little bit noise. Let's bear with that. So as it, as you can see from your left hand side, with the use of st steady airflow, we generally see very large bubbles. And on your right hand side, with the use of oscillatory airflow, we can see that the bubble size is much smaller. And also, there are larger, there's a larger population of bubbles. So, the use of oscillatory airflow brings better gas dispersion in the flotation system. I just play it once more so that you can have a look at more. And the second thing is that I measured the gas hold up uh, on the different subfish air velocity conditions uh, under these two airflow conditions, steady air and oscillatory air. So as expected, at every superficial air velocity conditions, we see a higher gas hold up uh, with the use of oscillatory airflow. So that's the first information that is conveyed in this figure. And the second thing I want you to have a look at is that with the steady air flow curve, we generally see that the gas holdup increased steadily with increasing the superficial air velocity from one to three centimeters per second, which corresponds to the homogeneous flow regime, where the number of bubbles increased with increasing the superficial air velocity. While further increasing the superficial air velocity to four centimeters per second, we only saw a slight increase in the gas holdup, which corresponds to the transition regime where bubbles start to coalesce. Um, this actually is in very good co uh, uh, correlation with the fact that in the cold 
handling and preparation plant, usually the superficial air velocity is controlled at one to three centimeters per second. However, when we have a look at the oscillatory airflow curve, the gas holdup almost increased linearly with increasing the superficial air velocity all the way to four centimeter per second, a very high superficial air velocity. I didn't do any more work in this area because four centimeter per second is kind of the limit that I am able to achieve um, back in the time when I was doing my PhD. So this means that at such a high superficial air velocity, it is still within the homo homogeneous flow regime. So with the use of oscillatory air, the traditionally recognized one to three centimeter per second superficial air velocity limits might be further extended to a higher value. And this means higher bubble carrying capacity and hence a potential higher flotation kinetics. I also did some work uh, about the dynamic foam stability. And this figure shows the maximum foam height as a function of the superficial air velocity. Uh, generally speaking, oscillatory air flow always give a, more, a higher foam height, which means a, a stable, more stable foam at every superficial air velocity condition. And lastly, um, this, this slide shows the results of um, some flow pattern inside the flotation column tests. Uh, as I previously mentioned that in a flotation column, uh, the near plug flow condition is more favorable for froth flotation. So I want to characterize what the flow pattern inside the flotation column is. So what I did is to measure the liquid residence time using a tracer method. Um, so the tap water is fed into the flotation column by using a thin inlet. And then the measurement was taken out at the detailing discharge port. So the difference between this one, this test with the previous flotation tests is that for the flotation tests, I recycle everything back to the feed sump to achieve semi-continuous flotation. Uh, and for this test, it's open circuit, so fresh in, uh, and it's measured in at the discharge port. So when the steady, steady state was reached, I added five mil of electrolyte solution exactly adjacent to the in input, so they follow the fluid flow. So the electrical conductivity was measured at the tailing output. The idea, until all of the electrolyte solution was discharged out of the system. The idea is that if the flow pattern inside the flotation column was really turbulent, we would expect a wider curve of salt concentration as a function of time. So here I use a liquid dispersion number to characterize, to represent the spread of the curve. And a lower number of liquid dispersion number means a less turbulent uh, situation or a flow nearer to the plug flow condition. So as you can see from here, um, at every superficial air velocity conditions, oscillatory airflow is given much lower number of the liquid dispersion number, which means that with the use of oscillatory airflow, the flow pattern inside the flow, flotation column is near to flag flow, plug flow condition, which is favorable for froth flotation. So this is basically the things I want to deliver uh, in this presentation. So firstly, we studied the effect of oscillatory air supply in improving the flotation performance. So what we found out is that at low frequency levels, it negatively affects the flotation performance, while at higher uh, frequency levels, it improves, it positively affects the flotation performance. And the product yield uh, increase sometimes can reach 30, 40 percentage points. Um, the high frequency oscillatory air supply helps with the co-flotation process as to, in terms of reducing the chemical consumption in the plant, improving the flotation performance of difficult to flow coast. These include uh, the oxidized coast and ultrafine coast and oxidized ultrafine coast, and also improving the throughput. 
And in terms of the background reasons, in terms of how, why the high frequency oscillatory air flow could help with the improvement of the flotation, is that it could provide better gas dispersion or say higher bubble surface area flux. And also it gives a stronger foam stability and also higher gas holdup. Uh, also it reduces the axial mixing or say the turbulence inside the flotation column. Apart from the results I show you here, um, I did some other tests, including the size-by-size -size flotation tests to see which size fraction is the oscillatory air uh, flow affecting more. And also uh, to, uh, to characterize the, the pop, to measure the pop, pop phase recovery and also the fraud, fraud phase recovery to see whether the contribution is made more by the pop zone or the fraud zone. So things like that, all of them are, have been, some of them have been published into the papers while the others is available in the ACOP report back in 2017. So if you are interested, you, are, you might just go there and have a look. Um, so that's all of the things I wanna sh show you today. Thank you very much for sitting through. Thank you very much, um, Jeannie. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, from the audience here, I can imagine we may have some questions. Um, if there were any questions, oh, I'll pass over to the flotation guys. <laughs> Jeannie, thank you very much. That was great. Well done. Um, I'm sure you know from your subsequent work that you've been doing with, with Angus and Joyce is that what this is very much missing is bubble size information. Um, so if you can go <laughs> exactly, but it was it, it's a it's a question of being able to do the measurement, uh, which I'm sure was the reason why this wasn't done was because mm -hmm. the fancy toys that we have not everybody has. Um, can you maybe I missed this in the beginning when I, I was focusing on other things in the back of my mind? Did did you do the measurements of this as a function of MIB dosage? Because I think what is what would be very interesting to see, particularly if one can measure bubble size, is to decouple the effect of oscillatory air addition with the, uh, on bubble size with the effect of MIBC on bubble size and to see how the two interact. I think that would be extremely interesting, particularly when you're showing that the DFI is changing as a, as a function of oscillatory air addition. And uh, firm stability is very much a function of for the dosage and I would be I'm almost surprised because it shouldn't matter how you generate the bubbles and um, in terms of how quickly they're going to coalesce in the froth phase but it's obviously happening so that's an interesting dynamic I think there's a lot here that should be followed up on that we should follow up on yeah good work <laughs> So thank you so much for your comments and questions, Lisa. So for your first comment about the bubble size measurement, we didn't do much work on that. It's simply because that at the time of me doing PhD, we don't have such a, we have APBS, but our column is already long enough, more than one meters. So we actually don't have the capability to yeah, do the bubble size. So, yeah, true. It's only five Wait, centimeters in it. diameter. <laughs> true. <laughs> But that's something I definitely want to have a look um, to quantify the bubble size comparison between the two airflow conditions. That's definitely something I want to do. Um, in terms of the second question for the MIBC dosage effect, effect, I actually did that, but it's just because of the limitation of my um, time in my doing my PhD. I don't really have time to analyze every data, but I do have that data. I compared the bubble size at, at different MIBC dosage levels, ranging from a low dosage level below CCC all the way to dosage level above CCC. Uh, one thing for sure is that ev at every condition, also the use of oscillatory airflow reduces the bubble size. So, but I don't have uh, I don't have a very clear data to show you how the changes are as the brother uh, dosage increases or not. But that's something I will have a look at. Yeah. Sorry. Um, 
We currently have a very simplistic understanding of the effects on bubble size in terms of the binary between bubble generation mechanism and frother dosage, where we say, well, above triple C it's this, below triple C it's that. But I think what this demonstrates is that it's actually a much more complex issue. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very much worth investigating further. Okay. And also for the majority of the flotation tests we did here is actually uh, conducted at conditions above the CCC of the frother dosage. So at conditions above the CCC of frother, we still got better flotation performance with the use of all solitary air. So in terms of the last one, um, the follow-up study, the reason why I decided to give a Friday seminar today is because that I feel like that there are, there's still a lot of work that can be done in this field, but I simply just don't have time um, to do that. So I, the one thing is that I would like to share the results with every one of you, and the other one is to get comments and feedback from the smart minds to see what direc direction can I go in the if this work is followed up in the near future. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and questions. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank, thanks, Shinyu. Um, that was very interesting. It's the first time I've, I've seen this work uh, because um, things are kept locked down, I think, uh, in this oscillatory, oscillatory work. So I have two questions um, yeah. kind of related. Is, is this a shame, as Lisa mentioned, that you weren't able to measure bubble size, but do you have an impression of whether the Festo um, oscillatory air supply or the uh, fluidic oscillator produced a finer bubbles or whether they were similar? First question. And the second question is, in your results, you, you present steady, um, steady air supply versus oscillatory. Um, what oscillatory air supply were you showing? Was there a difference in performance between the Festo flow meter and the fluidic oscillator? Okay. So thank you very much for uh, the question, Angus. Uh, so in terms of the work, actually, um, I, the oscillatory air, the effect of oscillatory air on the flotation performance was firstly published in 2017, um, co-authored by uh, UQ and the uh, University in UK. So we published the work together and now there are three groups, uh, two groups that is working on the topic. The first one is my previous um, PhD supervisor, Dr. Li Wang Wan. And the second one is a postdoctoral research student that was doing postdoc when I was the fourth year um, of my PhD. So he's now a professor, associate professor in China, and he's doing conducting, following up with the work as well. So for the two questions you asked me, it's all about the comparison of the fluid oscillator and the solar nerve valve. So for the first question in terms of the bubble size, um, I, I've, I don't have a concrete answer for that. What I feel like is that with using either one of the, the device, the bubble size is able to be decreased. So that's for sure. But a comparison of the bubble size generated between the two devices, I don't have an answer for that. And for the second question, it's about the flotation performance between comparison between the fluid oscillator and the solar nerve valve. I actually done, did that work. I couldn't remember whether I have published that work or not, but I did the comparison and the flotation performance was similar at frequencies above 36. So for the fluid oscillator, uh, I can only do experiments at 74 Hertz. Um, with solar nerve valve, I can control the frequencies to be anything I want. So the comparison was made between the fluidic oscillator at 74 hertz and the solar nerve valve at 36 hertz. But I assume that solar nerve valve at 36 would give similar results as solar nerve valve at 74. So the result is that the flotation performance was similar between the two. Brilliant. And just a quick follow up. So in the, that fluidic oscillator, it seemed like there was a movable, the feedback loop was yeah. movable. Is that how you control the oscillating frequency? Yes, sorry. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that in the presentation. Yes, that's the way how to control the frequency because you, you can simply change the frequency by changing the length of the feedback loop. Uh, with a longer feedback loop, you would expect that the frequency would be lower because of a longer delay for the air to draw the the air from the the other exit uh, control terminal. So 
there will be a longer delay, so the frequency will be uh, lower. So the reason why I didn't change the feedback loop is actually fluidic oscillator is actually not um, as easy to control as compared with the solenoid valve. And also, as I show you in the presentation, it's a little bit noisy. I don't really want to do much work on. It's very noisy. So, so yeah, I didn't change that, but it can be changed by changing the length of the feedback loop. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, a nice presentation, and I like the slides, particularly those three uh, D animation show of the uh, facilities. Uh, I'm not working in flotation, so to help me and some of the audience in that room to understand that what's the current state of this technology and what's the potential for industrial application, is a couple take any follow up study on like uh, after your project. So just give a general comment on the potential of this technology. So thank you very much for your comments and questions, Frank. So uh, I'm happy you like the presentation. So making the PowerPoint slides is kind of a way for leisure for me. I kind of <laughs> <laughs> really, I'm ready to making, making the presentations of different showing things in different formats. So thank you very much for the comments. Uh, in terms of the current state of the research, uh, as I said before, the work was firstly started in 2017 uh, when I was doing my PhD. Um, so at the time of me graduating, submitting my thesis in October 2017, the first step of the lab work of this work was completed and uh, the proposal for the second stage, which is the pilot plant and plant trial. Uh, the proposal was approved sometime April uh, 2018, something like that. So um, the second stage aims at the um, application of the technique in pilot plant trial and also further to plant trial. Um, now it is one of the postdoc that is working in the grants group that is handling this. Um, I actually, I don't, I don't have an idea how the pro progress is going on right now, but they are doing it, the industrial application. And for the other postdoc that have went back to uh, China, uh, he's doing this topic as well, but He's published one paper recently, but I'm not sure how the progress is going on either. But it's definitely, it is in the industrial application trial in the advanced work. Thank you for that. Um, uh, hi, Je hi, Junior. That's, this is excellent work. Um, it's been a long time since I worked in cold prep, but uh, some some ideas I had. Um, I'm not sure if you've worked on uh, whether this this method can work for coarser particle flotation. Because um, thinking from a from a, a metallurgist point of view, if you could uh, increase the desliming um, uh, screen size, say from 0.5 mil to 0.6, uh, you get a higher throughput. Potentially, um, with a with a higher gas holdup, potentially could could float um, more fine coal um, through this method, and that might also improve the efficiency of the the core circuit because you're taking out some of the fines of the core circuit. So it could could have a double whammy effect. I don't know. Are, are you look, thinking about looking at this at all? Yeah. Thank you so much for the question, Rob. So I actually I have the same idea when I was doing PhD. I was thinking that. Uh, in the last slide, I show you that the axial mixing or the turbulence inside the flotation column was actually can be reduced. This means that it provides a more uh, quiescent flow condition inside the flotation column, or we say near plug flow condition. This means that it might have something to do with the detachment of the coarse particle attachment to the air bubbles. So I was thinking that there should be an effect on the coarse particle flotation as well. So. Uh, I did the size by size flotation. So in four or five size fractions, um, 
minus 38, 38 to 106, 106 to 250, something like that, and above 250. So we've got ultra fines and also the size fractions that usually have a very good flotation rates and also the coarse size fractions. So the result is the ultra fine particle uh, flotation results I've already shown there. There is a significant improvement. And for the 38 to 106 and 106 to 250, uh, there is an improvement, but the improvement was just uh, very slightly. And for the coarse materials, unfortunately, there's no improvement at all. So the results was uh, is available in the ACOP report. Oh, uh, unfortunately, I didn't I didn't publish that section, but it is available in the ACOP reports. And no, there's no effect on the course material. But I still feel like that there should be an effect. Maybe it's the way. Maybe something some parameters that I need to control and I didn't consider at that time. But if I've got opportunity in the future, I might just have to cut that area again. Thank you. Uh, hi, Junior. I have a question. Very good presentation. So you mentioned that uh, you get bubbly flow uh, between one centimeter per second to three meter per second, right? Mm -hmm. uh, superficial gas velocity. But have you tried like different uh, uh, frothers other than MIBC and at different concentrations? Because if you change further type and also the further concentration, even at a very narrow range, you get your bubble size gets affected, and that basically changes the performance of your flotation. Yeah. So thank you very much for the question. I agree uh, with your comments. So actually, uh, last year or the year before, I did some um, further characterization work together with Lisa. Suggesting that um, MIBC is kind of a weak frother with a CCC sitting to be more than 15, 15, something like that, ppm, while some other frothers are already strong and you're able to get this, reach the CCC at just a, a few PP, ppm levels, three, four, five ppm. So uh, I agree with what you said is that by changing a different frother, it might, the conclusion might change, but um it's kind of um so i agree with that but i feel like that the chance the, the general chance will stay the same so if it's not one to three centimeter per second it might just one to two centimeter per second or something like that the chance will stay there with the change of prototype this would Um, sorry, I didn't hear quite clearly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I, okay. So, okay, yes, please tell me. <laughs> uh, no, the, the question that Shujat was putting forward is that in his previous work in his master's, he saw that there was significant change um, using a different frother type by changing the superficial gas velocity between 0.5 and 1.5. Is that correct, Shujat? Yes. So, the, uh, in, in terms of specific frother type, it has to do with its effect on um, um, the surface tension, uh, which is what changes the um, the nature of the bubble surface, which impacts the probability that the bubble will coalesce with another upon collision. So, the, um, from that point of view, the actual type of frother that you use is almost irrelevant compared to the actual final effect it has on the bubble surface, which you can achieve with different frother dosages and the way that they interact with different chemical components within your flotation system. Uh, and so the final bubble size and hence the final bubble surface area flux is, as I mentioned earlier, is actually quite a complex phenomena that is dependent on the interplay of a number of factors that ultimately come down to the probability of bubble coalescence, which has to do with bubble size, bubble surface tension, the number of bubbles, the turbulence in the system, etc. So to try and reduce it down to um, frother type 
is, is looking at the problem too simplistically. I uh, hope that answers your question, Shuja. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Great. Um, Jinyu, I don't know if you could turn your attention to some of the questions. I think the top one and the second from last one are the same question. I wonder if you could address, if it hasn't been addressed already. Okay. About the, um, so the first question is, uh, why like, does low frequency air have such a detrimental effect on the yield and it's similar to the uh, okay. um, so, question as well? So um, in terms of why the low frequency oscillatory air have a detrimental effect on the flotation uh, performance, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to explain it during the presentation. So actually during the experiments, I can't observed by bare, bare eyes that um, the pulp froth phase inter, in, inside the flotation column is very unstable. It fluctuates because of the low frequency. I guess that's one of the reasons. And the second one is that significant bigger bubbles is generated on the lower frequencies. There might be some other measures to further understanding the effect. Unfortunately, um, as far as I can understand, uh, as far as I can answer the question now, that's the only two uh, reasons I can explain. Um, okay, um, I think you mentioned about um, your, your size by size yeah. flotation results. So I think this question has been answered. Okay. Um, and then this one you mentioned, am I right in thinking you weren't able to measure the bubble size? So okay. um, what was the estimated bubble size in the steady air column? Uh, I want to do a little bit more in explanation for the third one. So in terms of the comparison of the two airflow conditions sure. uh, for the bubble size comparison. So the reason why we started the research is because that the publication by UK states that the bubbles generated can be micro, micro bubbles. That's very small. Usually to achieve bubbles as small as the, in the micro, range you need such as dissolved air uh, method which is very very energy intensive and this is very attracting they say that is simply by using a mechanical method you are able to uh, decrease the bubble size to the micro range but when i started the research i found out that they didn't when they do the comparison they are comparing the bubble sizes on the two different airflow rates which is absolutely no i feel like that is not really appropriate so what I found out is that when you compare the two airflow conditions at the same airflow rate, actually it's still very hard to go down to the micro size range. But all the thing I can say is that no matter how small the steady airflow is able to give the bubble size, by using oscillatory airflow, you could further bring down the bubble size. So in terms of the bubble size, I don't have a concrete figure, uh, but it depends on, it also has something to do with the spotter you're using, uh, the aperture size matters, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something I wanna add. Um, okay, thank you. Um, the last question from Francisco will close us off, I think. Um, just highlighting, um, referring to the oscillatory air supply, the JG, your report. Yeah is the peak value or the RMS value of this new solid? Sounds like a great question. Yeah, I was <laughs> <laughs> referring to the oscillatory, the JD report is... is or it might be one you want to take offline and, and yeah. chat to him, that's up to you. Um, I don't actually understand the question. The JD is... <laughs> Angus will be stepping in. In, in plain English, so what what Pancho is asking is essentially um, you, you've got a JG with the steady air supply, which is based on a volume flow rate. Yes. Did you calculate and, and then you compare that with the oscill oscillatory air supply? Yeah. Did you correct for the fact that the air is diverted either into the tank or into you know into the world? So you only have half as much air volume flow rate. Did you correct for that or did you um, okay. use, so he, he talks about the root mean okay. square of the sinusoidal. Okay. So thank you so much for helping me out, Angus. So um, at the first beginning, we were only using the fluidic oscillator. So the problem with that one is that it has one inlet uh, that receives the steady air, the steady air in inlet and two outputs. And we were only using one of the outputs. 
So we actually don't know how much air is going through the flotation column. And later on, we changed it to uh, solenoid valve, and we are able to reset up the device to allow one inlet and one output. So everything goes into the device, goes into the flotation column. So uh, at the first beginning, we were worrying about the JG comparison, as Pancho stated here. So later on, when we use this solenoid valve, we only have one, one inlet, one output. So we, what we only need to do is to control the input of the air is exactly the same amount so that we are able to make sure that the volume of air feeding into the flotation cell is the same. Okay, I think that was a really good discussion session. Thank you for your answers and everyone's participation um, online and also in the room. Um, I think if you can just join me one more time to thank Jimmy. Thank you. Um, so for next week, Friday the 12th of March, we have Dr. Penny Stewart, who's the CEO and founder of Petra Data Science. Um, they are the leading provider of digital mine to mill software for value chain optimization. They're based here in Brisbane, so I hope you can come and join us then. Um, and thanks again. Thank you.